So welcome on our community hangouts. Uh, today's meeting is fully dedicated to the storefront API updates on the storefront API from the product manager side, from the development side. So I don't want to waste the time. So let's go with the content. So the first one will be Nishant. All right. Thank you all. Can you all see my screen? Yep. All right. So thank you for joining the community hangout for Storefront API. I will uh, give a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Nishant Kapoor and I'm a product manager on Magento Commerce. Uh, I work on uh, GraphQL uh, microservices initiative and uh, Storefront API, obviously. And uh, I'll give you a, a kind of a vision where we are headed, what we are building towards. So if you can see my screen, this is kind of an end state block diagram. It's not an architecture diagram. Obviously, the stack will not look like this uh, when everything is done. But logically, uh, just to describe where we are building, uh, this is a pretty good representation. So before we jump into uh, storefront API and, and microservices, um, I would like to start with the first layer that you see on the top, which is commerce data graph. This is the entry point for all uh, headless clients. So anyone who is building a, a, either using a Magento PWA or building their own React app or uh, using AEM or building any customer touch point, this will be the entry point uh, for all clients. And right now we do have a, a GraphQL layer which is tightly coupled uh, with the monolith. And what we are doing uh, is taking apart that GraphQL layer and rebuilding it into its own uh, graph server, which will be a node-based graph server. And uh, that will serve as the entry point to all the services that are offered by Magento Monolith, uh, Magento Microservices, Magento SaaS. And that will also serve as an extensibility point uh, for partners and developers to integrate to uh, their own uh, services they have written, any third party service that they want to integrate into. Um, so they, we will do another uh, Hangout specifically on the Node GraphQL. Um, but one layer down from the, the graph layer is where the microservices initiative comes in, which is the storefront API. So what we are doing is, uh, slowly breaking down uh, the monolith into smaller uh, microservices. We are starting with the storefront functionality, the, the pieces that you need to build a storefront. And we are focusing right now on catalog microservice. So the idea is we will take the functionality out of the monolith uh, without actually changing the monolith. So monolith does not change. There's no impact. You can continue to use uh, monolith. It's just we are taking it out in, into a separate application catalog will have its own storage and you will be able to deploy it separately uh, into its own container. So uh, we'll start with catalog, then we have uh, search, customer, cart and checkout. So basically when everything is set and done, you will have a, a number of microservices that, that can be deployed and scaled independently and those microservices will communicate with the, the commerce data graph or the node server via gRPC protocol. And I, I believe in the last hangout, uh, we demoed gRPC. Uh, so if you have, if you missed that hangout, I think the recording I'm sure is available somewhere or you can check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, so, I will stop here. I, this is, uh, if you have any questions on, on the vision, what we are building, uh, please feel free to reach out to me on, on community Slack. I'm there, uh, there to answer any questions. Or if you have any questions that you would like to ask now, uh, just put it in the chat window of BlueJeans. Uh, as far as timing is concerned, we are looking for a, an early access program for uh, for catalog around Q1 of 2021, so end of the year or beginning of uh, next year. So if you are interested in testing it out, please again reach out to us and uh, we'll chat more. So 
Uh, I will pause here and, and give the control back to Stanislav. Uh, let's jump into uh, the details. Thank you, Nishant. Great mm -hmm. vision, upcoming plans. So yeah, let's move on to, to the prize, prize group design presentation by Andre. Hi, everyone. So um, I will show you the uh, design of new, our new pricing system. It's just one of the boxes on the diagram that Nishan just showed you. And as you probably know, we have uh, some issues with uh, pricing in Magento right now. And the uh, main issue is that we are building two uh, large index. We are trying to pre-compute all possible uh, combinations of prices uh, beforehand. And for some merchants, this is completely unnecessary and takes a long, long time. So if we uh, move existing structure to, to, the mo uh, to the storefront as is, it will actually double the problem. And uh, in addition to our standard Magento pricing index, we will introduce one more heavyweight pricing index. So uh, this proposal is um, trying to uh, minimize the work we need to do uh, with prices. And just to remind, uh, the existing dimensions of our price index is product ID, website ID, and customer group. So we are uh, calculating all possible prices for all these dimensions. However, we know that our real merchants are using Magento in a slightly different way. For example, the uh, websites could be used just as a website, a URL, uh, and multiple websites may have a completely same price. Uh, the same for customer groups. So customer group is very overloaded entity in, in Magento. We are using it for pricing. We are using it in B2B, in um, tax classes. We are using it for m actually many reasons. And merchants also use it for a class of service for the customers and so on. So uh, what it means is that uh, the um, actual prices are not always present for each customer group. And I have a few examples here where uh, it's possible to reduce the index size in 26 times, in 100 times. And the main idea is to reuse the uh, prices where possible. So if a website number one, two, five, seven, and 10 has have the same price, we may potentially use the same record in database in order to serve many consumers, many customers. So um, instead of one uh, direct lookup into the index, uh, we propose to uh, have one preliminary uh, lookup that will uh, resolve a new entity called price books. For example, we may uh, extract the 10% discount price book from the database, store it in customer session, and then we will look up prices based on the price books. Uh, this will uh, re potentially reduce uh, the number of records in the resulting price index table. Um, one more um, issue we have with um, the pricing is that uh, our price index supposes that we have to store all products there. However, our uh, customers usually have customer group specific prices only for few products in catalog. 
for example, they uh, those custom prices may be a result of physical contract with uh, another companies, and usually uh, it, it, uh, the physical contract doesn't affect all catalog of all store. Uh, mm, so this is one more opportunity to reduce uh, the size of the index and that's why we um, we introduce the concept of default price books which uh, will contain all prices for all products but it will contain only default prices and we introduce a customer group specific price books that uh, will contain uh, prices for specific price groups and in addition for only some set of the products. So now it will be possible to create a price book with single product in it. And we also hope that uh, this will uh, re reduce the uh, size of, uh, of price index significantly. And what what else? Um, so uh, yeah, let's talk a bit more about that picture. So uh, on top of that picture, you can see the existing pricing structure for one customer group and one website uh, in the monolith. So we can see the base price here, the next layer is a customer group price, then we have a catalog group prices and, and special price. In the new structure, we will have uh, only two layers and it will be kind of snapshot uh, from the monolith. Uh, the system will try to find some prices in customer specific price book first and if the uh, price is not present there, it will fall back to the default price where uh, some price always present for any product in the system. Um, so th th this is the shape of API. Uh, you can um, you can see it on our Magento architecture GitHub offline. I will not uh, take a lot of your time reviewing the API, but here is the pull request Magento price books in uh, Magento architecture GitHub. You can explore it if you interested. Um, another uh, thing here is to um, try to split our customer groups per uh, the use case. We know that our customer groups are used in many uh, behaviors, many places in the system, and uh, we may make uh, customer groups more specialized here. So in that proposal, we also want to have some separate customer groups which are uh, connected with pricing and another customer groups which are connected with other parts of the system. Uh, this will also, we hope that it will um, reduce the data size in index and make things more clear and structured. Um, one more important um, feature of new design is that we want to increase the number of supported prices for uh, for a single product. For now, it's um, more or less real to have up to 100, maybe 200 prices per product. In new design, we are targeting for um, 15 thousand prices per product and we want to make the reliable platform for future uh, and we uh, that platform should include customer specific prices so it's not the uh, customer group pricing we are moving towards the uh, personalized pricing feature and uh, our 
existing design of catalog service supposed to have some kind of projection uh, of product that contain all information like um, SQ, name, and prices. Uh, this is required to serve um, search capability uh, to be able to filter product by prices. So everything should be combined into one big document. However, uh, the catalog service is designed to handle large number of products, but not uh, large products inside the catalog. That's why putting 15,000 additional fields into the product is a little bit challenging for catalog service. And for such scenarios where we have too much uh, product, uh, too much prices per product, we will introduce the fallback. Uh, so the fallback will happen on the pricing service and in, in comparison to the uh, first, um, first purple example where we have very few prices in the product and lookup happens uh, in one pass. Uh, the second case, which is marked by red color, uh, show you that we're going to have two passes actually. The, the, and in the first pass, we will extract products that are marked uh, with a special flag, which says that uh, actual pricing for the product is uh, stored in the separate service. And GraphQL or some another service uh, will make the consequent request in order to enrich the results with the uh, pricing information. So this allows us to pick appropriate storages for prices and um, appropriate scale for prices if needed and make a separation of concerns here. So the catalog will be targeted to handle a large amount of products, of small products, and the pricing service will uh, serve the large amount of prices per product. Um, so I guess uh, that's it. Just to recap and summarize everything, we know that uh, our dimensions are uh, too heavy for pricing, and we can uh, attack the existing problem with from three directions. We can reduce the number of products in price books. We can try to reuse the prices for different price books, and we can try to reuse uh, prices for different websites if it's possible. And this proposal just compiles uh, that together. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, Andre, can you also confirm that uh, this design will not require any admin changes? So it's only at storage level? Uh, yes, so um, we are building the new uh, system, new storefront system, and we plan to uh, transparently move data from Magenta Monolith to storefront pricing service. And by the way, here is the row uh, algorithm. Okay, so I think that's it. Pass. Yep, thank you, Adri. Looks very promising. So, guys, if you are interested, in some new prices design, feel free uh, to reach out to Andre or to find the issue in the architecture repository, leave the comments, and so on. So, guys, let's move on and talk about some media content as a part of product data. So, Oliver Kapolova will tell us about that. Oliver, mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay, let's just turn to 
share screen. Okay. Can you see catalog images page? Yes. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> so now let's talk about catalog images. And uh, a note here is that uh, this document reflects general vision from Gento, but uh, it is also focused specifically on catalog images or catalog media to be less abstract and to be able to focus on specific needs that we have right now in scope of catalog storefront project. But in general, it uh, uh, shows our direction as Magenta product, our vision on how we handle media. And the main idea is that uh, we want uh, to offload media management to specialized systems and uh, also to make Magenta more open to integration with those uh, systems. First, let's start from terminology. So we are on all on the same page. So we'll be talking about assets. Asset is anything that exists in binary format. In case of uh, Magento catalog uh, or Magento products, for example, those are images and video, but uh, asset is something uh, bigger, something broader. Also, we'll be talking about DAM systems uh, pretty like frequently and uh, the management systems uh, and the responsibility of them is to actually TDN content delivery network, everybody probably aware of them. And when we are talking about media and delivery, it's a use. It, it can be part of them, but in general, this is just a delivery. Assets, uh, in our case, images sales, uh, to the client, and it can be part of uh, them. Important Sorry. part be because uh, everything would be much more easier if you wouldn't have image transformation. Uh, okay. And uh, image transformation what in. About? Yes. What about, I'm sorry for the interruption. Yeah. We didn't see a screen right now. Yeah, we you lost screen and uh, your voice is coming mm -hmm. in choppy. Yeah, I think I think I have some issues. I thought it was resolved. Can you see the screen now? Uh, yeah. Hello. Once again, uh, how about now? Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Let's try to con yeah. Let's try to continue. Where did you? Where did we stop? What did you hear? If anything. Uh, I I believe we lost like one one or two minutes. One of the, okay, I think that's all my minutes that I had. Uh, so, and again, if it doesn't work, let's try again. If it doesn't work, I have video recording, so of everything, which is one, or think we should be able maybe to share it. Let's see. But so far, yeah, we are talking about catalog images, and I want to cover uh, our vision on uh, media management or asset management in Magento. And the main idea is to offload uh, asset management to specialized systems. So uh, first, let's talk about terminology. Uh, we will be talking about assets uh, in simple words uh, in uh, as part of product or cat uh, catalog. Those are images and videos, but there can be more. Uh, we will be talking about DEM systems, digital asset management systems. Uh, they are responsible for actual asset management. Uh, CDN, which is Content Delivery Network, uh, and its important part usually can be part of a, a DEM system or 
built on top of uh, like to the asset delivery is uh, actually the process of delivering the asset to the client uh, because one thing is just to manage assets and another thing is to deliver those can be combined in one system or those can be separate systems uh, image transformation that's i think where i stopped so image transformation uh, in magento we have such things as resizing rotation watermarking but uh, it can be a more broad uh, set of features about image transformation. The main thing is that uh, an, an admin or an author uploads uh, an image and then some trans transformation happens in order to deliver to the client what the client requests or what we uh, configure. Uh, so we will talk a little bit about image transformation and how we see it. Magento back office or Magento admin. I think everybody knows what is it. Uh, in we say that Magento admin is responsible for product management and images or assets to the products. The log store front application. This is uh, what. Uh, so this is a, a representation of a catalog which is managed in theme system product. Uh, uh, so catalog provides uh, APIs for the client, PWA or whatever other client we have. It's product information, product categories we have. That's about terminology. Next, what I want to cover is a scenario quickly and uh, or scenarios uh, quickly and uh, the, I want to cover what changes what's the difference in the vision and uh, will be a, there is a pull request in architecture catalog media tech vision where uh, it would be great if uh, you can leave uh, some comments if you have concerns about the vision for example you know that some use cases won't be covered with a new approach so let's go back to scenario from the purple area. That's where an author or admin do the digital asset management. Uh, the system may perform some. Now we go to red area, which is uh, product information management uh, part, uh, where an Magento admin dates or creates a product and also link it to the asset in the uh, in the dump uh, so magento uh, should have some ui probably that allows to select uh, the asset uh, or it can be api which allows you to just specify the url to the asset after that uh, asset uh, URL or image URL is synced to service for this product and uh, uh, it will be available on the catalog service API. Uh, so here we are saying that we are syncing full image URLs as part of product data and we are syncing original, uh, original image URLs only. We don't sync resized images and so on. Uh, after that, uh, the green area is how this data is used. So there is a client or there is a visit. It uh, uses PWA or whatever client we have. And uh, to, it makes requests to GraphQL, fetches product data. And as part of this product data, we will have uh, pro, uh, image URLs. Uh, after that, client fetches uh, those images and uh, the urls are pointing to uh, the urls provided by the dumb system uh, usually there will be some cdn involved and this cdn can also make some transformations because some cdn support it uh, i think most cdns support it in one or another way if uh, the image is not present it's uh, uh, being fetched from the uh, dumb system where there can be additional uh, transformation on the fly as well. 
several pieces or several areas where transformation may happen, uh, but as you may notice, none of them belong to Magento. Magento doesn't care about transformation, and, uh, and transformation happens either CDN or in the uh, DAM system, DAM system, depending on what the system supports. Uh, to perform on the fly uh, transformations, that uh, transformation uh, that uh, URLs should uh, parameters. So, for example, so in our case, Magento uh, returns original URL to the image all the way from the admin and to the storefront and to the client. PA uh, adds additional parameters to specify what exact, um, like a spec ratio or quality or whatever it needs, and uh, CDN or uh, DAM system returns uh, uh, that kind of image. So that's expected. And let me talk quickly about a couple of things uh, that uh, are changing. So I already mentioned that transformation uh, is not supposed to happen on the Magento side. This may cause some um, uh, issues for the development scenarios, but we don't expect issues uh, for production scenarios because we expect that there will be at least CDN even if there is no DEM system. And CDN can provide transformation. For developer scenarios, it is possible to involve web servers such as Nginx or Apache to perform some transformations. Uh, then what else changes? So we talked about transformations, about watermarking. Watermarking is a special case of transformation because this uh, watermarking is not requested by the client and this, instead it is uh, configured by the store owner. So uh, I'm just saying that a couple we were looking at, they support some kind of uh, watermarking and I'm just covering what we, uh, like what we can use here. So in case of Magento Cloud, we can use Fastly and with a specific Fastly configuration, if you're talking about AEM products, they also provide some watermarking water capabilities. There are still some questions about scoping uh, that would need to be covered in more details when we get to it. But in general, it is supported. And uh, then the last thing is uh, placeholders. Uh, so placeholders uh, uh, can be used in couple use cases. One use case if there is no image assigned to the product and another use case if image is assigned but is not physically present on the in the storage. In both cases right now Magento returns placeholder which is which can be configured by the now we are saying that um, we are not going to um, this logic of deciding whether the image is a placeholder or a real image. So we are not going to handle it on the uh, Magento side on the side of storefront. We are going to just return uh, empty string if there is no image assigned, or we will be returning just image URL without any validation whether uh, such image is physically present. And the responsibility of the client is to handle the situation. This gives more flexibility to the client, so the client can decide which placeholder to use. Sometimes uh, it may make sense to provide place, placeholder as part of the client application and don't even fetch it uh, remotely. Uh, so there is this possibility. It's easy for the client uh, now to understand whether uh, it is a placeholder that should be displayed or real image. But in the uh, use cases where um, client still wants to display Magenta configured placeholder, we are saying that we can provide the uh, GraphQL API uh, for the Magenta for the Magenta configuration, which returns configured placeholders. In that case, uh, again, client decides whether to use it or not, and uh, it can display to um, support ex kind of existing functional functionality in Magenta. That's all. From my side, I think I took more time, especially because of the connection problems. Uh, 
but yeah, I'm done here. And uh, please leave your comments in the pull request. Thank you. Olga, if you don't mind, can you put the link to the pull request in the chat window? Yeah, yeah, sure. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Olga, for the great presentation. So let's move on to the presentation of the latest changes that was done since the last hangout. So, Misha, go on. Hey, everyone. So let me share my screen. So I will be brief and will not take a lot of your time. Uh, since the last hangout, we uh, merged 12 pull requests for Cloud Storefront Reaper and we uh, covered some functionality related to uh, functional extensibility and uh, functional coverage uh, like categories. Uh, we completely moved to our new Catalog API. Uh, it's another repo and it will become a new Catalog API in future, I believe. Also, we done with some another types of uh, like entities like a bundle products, uh, introduce it uh, right API that will uh, help uh, us to communicate to service uh, via gRPC in future. So currently we communicate with our storefront application over uh, introduce it API. Uh, it's related to storefront part, but we also have, uh, as I said, uh, another repository related to export API. And here we have uh, more uh, work because we try to add more features and uh, this uh, repo already used it in production for some our services, maybe some node PREX we have uh, recommendation services, also we'll have some search service that will use all this, this data. And uh, as you already uh, heard, we uh, have a huge proposal related to price books uh, and catalog media that uh, Andrea and Olga mentioned. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, another uh, documents in design. Some of them already merged, some of them still on the market. We are trying to build a unified approach for product options uh, and combine different uh, uh, options uh, for complex products, for custom options, and uh, move it to one entity. Also, we are rebuilding our vision, how we want to save and uh, work with product variants. It's not only related to configurable variants, uh, but uh, we want to have uh, uh, variants for all complex products. Uh, so I will send uh, all links to all proposals that we today discuss it and we have in the work to the Slack channel. Uh, so in the future plans, it's to extend our functionality coverage, to add more entities uh, that will be handled by Export API and Storefront correspondingly, and uh, also we are working on introducing gRPC. Currently, we still uh, use uh, some in-process calls. Uh, we have a lot of work as infrastructure, and uh, I really hope that in some future we will uh, be able to open our repos for all partners. Uh, for contributions, maybe in some like not so close future, it will be open for a more wide auditory, but uh, uh, we're still working on this. Uh, uh, so that's it from my side. I will send all uh, links to docu design documents to the Slack channel so you can check it. And yeah. Thank you, Misha. So, and the last topic for today, it's actually the demonstration of the category data transfer to storefront by Kovalenko CVE from the object web. So, let's watch it. Sergei, are you with us? Oh, hi, sorry. I wasn't able to unmute myself. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I'll start with uh, 
the idea how it's implemented right now. So right now we still have monolith, but in the future we will have uh, kind of uh, microservices uh, with network calls. So uh, I'll start with uh, category and category processing and save it. So uh, you can save category from backend or from API, Naze REST or Easy REST or SOAP API. And uh, after saving category, uh, we need to synchronize, to synchronize data, uh, category data with uh, our new storefront approach. So we have uh, Elasticsearch indexes for this, and we need to sync this data. So how it's working? So on after save of category, uh, we are dispatching feed indexer. Fit indexer it's a kind of indexer that is taking data from category and writing it to MySQL cache. Right now it's MySQL cache. In the future, no matter where it will be. Uh, and also, feed indexer is triggering a Rabbit MQ and publishing an event. This event is saying that we need to uh, take data from this feed from that cache and uh, process this data and put this data in Elasticsearch. Uh, GraphQL and all requests that will uh, come from GraphQL will fetch this data from that indexer. So basically it's a how it's working. It's just uh, over overview of how it's working. Okay, so and now I'm going to demonstrate to you how it's working right now. So we have uh, GraphQL, GraphQL extension, and we can just query uh, very basic information, uh, like category with ID and some basic attributes with children. So, right now you can see that there are no children, and there is only root category that is uh, category number two. Right now we are proceeding to admin and we will try and we will try to add a few more categories and I'll show how this works. So navigate into categories. As you can see, we have on the default category right now. Let's add one more subcategory. Let's say that it will be category one. I'm not adding any other attributes to it, just saving it. Right now, this category should be re indexed. It should be cached in Fit Indexer cache in uh, this table, and, Rabbit, uh, and new uh, message should be published to RabbitMQ. Then, RabbitMQ should take uh, data from Fit and should uh, so we have some ids for example id number one and id number two category consumer is taking the data by id number one and id number two from this cache uh, processing it and putting it to elastic search i'll show you uh how it looks like so we have two indexers and we have this indexer is catalog stuff from v11 category yeah and all data is actually stored in the index. Let's, let's just see this. Okay, we have uh, our new category created, and we have also default category. There are only two categories right now there. And if you run GraphQL query, uh, we will probably see this new category created. Okay, we see it. Yeah. Uh, Storefront is working with category three, so I can create subcategory for category one, and we'll call it subcategory one. After that, I can query children of children, and for example, I can query name. And I have subcategory one as well. Let's go back to category one and attach, let's say, some products to it. I have few products. 
configurable and virtual. Saving this data and I need to query these products as well. So I am on the level category and I'm just querying products, products, items, you name. And they also have, as you can see, the product. It's configurable product and virtual product. You also can get count of the products with product count attribute. You can see here the product. We can change, for example, include in menu uh, attribute, uh, set so this category to be excluded from the menu. And let's see if it's excluded. As you can see, it's that include in menu false. That's basically it. It's very pretty, but it's uh, pretty short from uh, the demo perspective, but it was a lot of work on this because uh, category has a lot of attributes and uh, we were needed to take into account of the attributes. Thanks. Maybe someone have some questions. That yep. looks great. Thank you, Steve. It was a great presentation. So actually, guys, we have 11 minutes left. Maybe someone have questions. I saw a lot of them on the chat, but some of them maybe we can discuss. So feel free to ask. Okay, if there are no questions, so thank you all for attending this meeting. Thank you guys for sharing the information and see you next time. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye.